it up before but now that we have a you know ultra so we have a very nice ultrasound machine that everything which pick up this and that also adds to the incident for this session on the topic ectopic pregnancy so uh, dr sada farai yes yeah. uh, so good morning or good afternoon everyone who is around here i'm going to uh, i am uh, dr sada farai janvete from obg resident in mmcri uh, i am going to talk a few things about ectopic pregnancy today uh, just a brief thing because ectopic pregnancy as such is a very wide topic Uh, so let's just begin with it. Uh, so so let's start with what is an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy is when uh, uh, implant when the implantation occurs anywhere except the normal endometrial cavity. Okay, even inside the uterus, it can get implanted in other places which is not normal. Even that is ectopic pregnancy. It also has a name ecchysis. So see the normal site of fertilization. Ovulation happens, the fibrae takes them up, and then it goes into the endometrium and gets implanted. This is the normal implantation site. So anything other than this is ectopic. Okay. So now let's come to history of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, okay, this is a very interesting story. I'm going to take the entire presentation like a story, so no one gets bored. Uh, the first, uh, the first known reference, the first written reference for ectopic pregnancy comes. Uh, in writings of an Arabic physician Abu Kalsas, what happened to him was there was a patient who had an abdominal swelling with suppuration, and in that era, they drained the suppuration. So in the drain, in the purulent drain, he found fetal bones. That is the first time. That is the first time I think uh, ectopic pregnancy was referenced anywhere. Okay, and only in 19th century did ectopic pregnancy have a adaptive attention towards it. So the ectopic pregnancy became a thing in 19th century. Okay, then came uh, the FC. Initially, we were in darkness. We didn't know anything about ectopic. And if ectopic pregnancy was diagnosed somehow, like someone came up with the thought that okay, this can be an ectopic pregnancy, then it meant maternal death. Okay, there is no other thing. There, yeah, uh, there is one particular sentence which is told of our dad. It told that if ectopic pregnancy is diagnosed, the grave is already yawning over the patient. The patient is already dying. Okay, but then came the person Robert Lawson Dale. Even uh, the idea was suggested to him that you can treat ectopic pregnancy surgically, but he himself laughed at it at a point. But he is like the Person who conducted so many laparotomies saved so many lives. He is the one who, you know, started the surgical treatment for ectopic pregnancy. So what had happened is initially, um, ectopic pregnancy meant death of the woman. Now surgical treatment became like the revolutionary thing in it, and surgical treatment saved the life of the person. Initially, 95 percent was the mortality of the mother. Now it became around 5 percent. Now what we uh, so uh, Robert Lawson Dale is the one who should get the credit for that. So now that uh, now that that was the era 19th century that was the era of the surgical treatment, surgical management. Then came the era of surgery, era of technological revolution. What happened is now that we can save the life of the person, we thought of saving their fertility also. Okay, what we used to do we used to just remove the tubes off. So the surgical treatment what was done, done widespreadly. Now we wanted to save the fertility of the woman. So if we have to save the fertility, we have to preserve the tubes. Okay, so that is where the technological revolution started. That is where the laparoscopic uh, methods started to came and solve. Where remove, instead of removing the tubes, we started to make small nick on the tubes and remove the tubes. We can try to preserve the tubes. Then now, then we entered the era of conservative approach. Actually, technological revolution and conservative approach kind of overlaps. And now we are in the present era where surgery still is, you know, the most specific treatment. But still, we try to save the tubes. We have a lot of approaches now. There is one particular paper which I enjoyed a lot when reading about ectopic pregnancy. The one which I have referenced on my slide, the history and of the diagnosis and treatment of ectopic pregnancy, a medical adventure. It's a wonderful paper. Gives you all the history about the ectopic pregnancy. Everyone should read it. Then everyone, has, if uh, you guys have time, please go through that paper. Coming to my next slide, let's see the epidemiology.
physiology of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, see, Lord, there is no study, there is actually no multi-centric study in India which is conducted so that we can tell this is particular incidence of ectopic pregnancy. But still in 1990, ICMR task force tried to find out and the incidence is around 3%, 3 per 1000 pregnancies. Okay, see, uh, now one more question here is ectopic pregnancy is on rise. Why? Because we now we have more infections. Okay, we have more pregnancies which follow artificial reproduction to repair things, infertility, etc. Early detection of the cases. Okay, here I want to uh, talk about one interesting point. That is, uh, 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 sometimes, you know, the ectopic pregnancy resolves itself or it can just abort outside the PPL end and disappear and nothing happens to the woman. Okay, this was never picked up before. But now that we have... Uh, you know, ultrasound, we have a very nice ultrasound machine and everything which pick up this and that also adds to the incidence. And, uh, you know, improving the diagnostics has also increased the ectopic pregnancies, right? But right now, as of current studies show that it's relatively stable. I don't want to go into details of what studies and everything, but recent studies say that now the, pregnant, the ectopic pregnancies are not on rise, the incidence is very pretty much stable now. Okay, but it rose like uh, in the past day, uh, past few weekends because of all these things. Okay, now coming to the risk factors, this is like the most important slide in the entire presentation. So I'm going to take a little time here. So uh, see, there are risk factors for ectopic pregnancy. Why? See, the normally the implantation should happen in the normal the normal endometrial site. Why is it happening there? Okay, it should happen like that. No, so there can be many factors for that. So what are the high risk factors are history of ectopic pregnancy. Okay, if a woman has history of one ectopic pregnancy, she has around 10 to 15% chance that she, she will have ectopic pregnancy next time also. If she has history of two ectopic pregnancies, there is almost 25% chance that she will have an ectopic pregnancy again. So more than a history of ectopic pregnancy is more the chance of having an ectopic pregnancy. That, uh, and uh, if she has a history of ectopic pregnancy, that means she has some human pathology. Which is going, which is continued in the next pregnancy also. Okay, any kind of disturbance to the tube causes the decrease in the peristalsis of the tube, and hence the ovum and the fertilized ovum cannot pass through the tube and go into the endometrial cavity. It will just get implanted somewhere there only in the tubes. Okay, the tubal ligation procedures, tubal pathologies, these any kind of tubal disturbance basically. Okay, then there is this interesting point of interest uh, in neutro uh, diethyl silvesterol exposure, DES. DES is like one of the medical tragedies we have, where it is called uh, adenocarcinoma in female fetuses. It was banned in 1970s, but we, uh, you know, the women in 1970s will be like 40, 50 years now, so we may not encounter this in our clinical practice anymore. And current IUCD user. See, I, here also I want to clear one particular point. See, if anybody is using an IUCD, it actually decreases the absolute number of ectopic pregnancies because, see, any kind of contraceptive method reduces the pregnancy number itself. So that's why ectopic pregnancies will be less. But if the IUCD or intrauterine device is already in place and a pregnancy occurs that time, when it is in the place, there is high chance of having an ectopic. But as then, see, 100, if 100 people are using a contraceptive method, only 10 people will get pregnant. Okay, but if nobody is using contraceptive method, all 100 will get pregnant, and that 10 will be ectopic. So in that, uh, but suppose if they are using contraceptive so it, it reduces the absolute number of ectopic pregnancies, but the risk is higher. Okay, now coming to moderate uh, risk, uh, things which have moderate risk of having ectopic, that is infertility. Okay, infertility usually occurs because there is some tubal pathology. Okay, so some tubal pathology, that pathology can be infection. See, gonorrhea and chlamydia co-infection is very common. PID, hair, means gonorrhea or chlamydia ka co-infection. Okay, or history, any history of pelvic inflammatory disease. Any kind of inflammation will cause fibrosis, will cause kinking of the tubes and will not allow the ovum to pass through the tubes and cause, and cause implantation of the abnormal site. And also multiple sexual partners, because see, multiple sexual partners means that there is high chance of having again a sexually transmitted infection which causes inflammation and again coming back to the same point. Okay, and smoking is known to increase uh, the risk of endocrine pregnancy by two folds. 
Why? Because smoking, uh, smoking will affect the cilia, as we all know that. So, smoking affects the cilia and cilia repeat capacity. So, if cilia are not repeating, the ovum is not passing through the tubes. Okay. Then there are risk, low risk factors, which are put up with risk, like any abdominal surgeries which might have disturbed the tubes and vaginal douching. Vaginal douching does not have a direct correlation. I think I'm going very deep. This which is not needed. Okay. Vaginal dosing is done usually when there is infection, right? So it is like a confounding factor. Vaginal dosing itself doesn't cause it. At early age of intercourse, also it is related like a confounding factor. Because at early age of intercourse, there is more sexual life and more chance of exposure to infections. And that's how it causes ectopic pregnancy. A very important slide, you know. But everything again comes back to some kind of tubal pathology. Okay. So let's go to ectopic sites. Okay, there are every anywhere other than the normal size is ectopic. So let's come from one side. On the tubes, we have which there are four parts of the tubes. So all four parts of the tubes that is isthmus, ampulla, fallopian, and fimbrial end. Okay, it, okay. let's go with interstitial. Interstitial is the most ampulla and fimbrial end. Then come to ovary. Now coming inside the uterus, it's uh, inside the uterus but still ectopic. That is in the place where there is previous cesarean scar, cervical canal, even abdominal pregnancies. Okay, I'll just show it in the next slide. It will be easier for you guys. So there is extra uterine and intra uterine. Okay, so two things. Even in intra uterine, a pregnancy can be ectopic, but it's not in the normal implantation phase. Okay, so coming to extra uterine ones. In extra uterine, it can be tubal, ovarian, or abdominal. So tube is the most common site. For ectopic pregnancy, in that again, ampulla is most common site because ampulla, the focus is going to be in the end, so the ovum pick up for it, then ampulla is going to be in the end, then the But ampulla is dilated, it is the most person constricted. The ampulla is the most region, it acts like a physiological structure. So, it will be very difficult to get the ovum to get the ovum. So, it will be very difficult to get the ovum to get the ovum. Okay. Then coming to interstitial part, okay, it's quite rare. Fimbrial is also rare because fimbrial can be okay, so when it is dissolved, okay, the body okay, dissolved goes on. The ovarian has around three percent, three percent of them are ovarian. Only one percent are abdominal. Abdominal is very, very rare. Okay, it can be primary abdominal or secondary abdominal. Primary abdominal means implantation abdomen is already okay. Secondary abdominal means tube can be more than the tube size, just the muscle can be thicker. एब्डोमिन में इम्प्लांट हुआ है, ठीक है? इंट्रा पेरिटोरियल और एक्स्ट्रा पेरिटोरियल और पेरिटोरियल के जो ऑर्गेन्स हैं, उसके हिसाब से डिवाइड किया है बस। देन कमिंग तू इंट्रा यूट्राइन, इट कैन बी सर्वाइकल्स, एंगुलर जहाँ पे यूट्राइन एंगल्स के पास और सिजेरियन 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 क bleeding होगा, stretch होने के वजह से episodic pain होता है, okay तो pain तो pain ही देखो भी pregnancy में ये बहुत stretching होता है tissue, okay then उसके वजह से यहाँ से जो bleeding होती है ना होता है it will spill from the fimbria लेट उसके वजह से भी थोड़ा बहुत ही वो peritoneum होता है eventually tube distend होता है distend होता है distend होता है फट जाता है, okay then when it ruptures it bleeds like anything because all these vessels which are around the you know, where, uh, where the, it is getting implanted, those all vessels are eroded. Okay. Those ke are, uh, those ke pass the, uh, then around the fetus, there is some amount of muscle, limited hypertrophy and hyperplasia. It's not like hyperplasia or hypertrophy happens in the normal uterus. No, it's not that much of that tube because there is less muscle. So it cannot contain it. Eventually, it ruptures. Right. Then coming to the next slide. Okay, now what can happen in the tube? In the tube, there is a pregnancy. So, it can undergo abortion. It can be resolved from itself. Or then, it can be removed from the fibrial end. It can be made a small hematocyl and it can be permanently made a chronic endocrine. Or then, like a normal abortion, there is a huge hemorrhage, right? Like that, it can hemorrhage and abort from the fibrial end also. Or it can form a tubal blood wound. Tubal blood wound is nothing but like an organized hematoma. The fetus is in the other half. In the other half, there is layers and layers of blood. Okay, which is organized in common layers. That's also one of the features. Now, this is, it 
are getting aborted ab when does it about the temporary reason that this is space but is the most to that is the short narrow i told you right is the most narrow so it's more likely to puncture to ye kaha pe do tubes ke do end rehte hain okay ek se ek jo broad ligament mein open hota hai ek jo bahar open hota hai so once that opens outside it may just perforate causing massive intraperitoneal bleeding and a very toxic condition Okay, it's called acute rupture ectopy, or it can, uh, you know, rupture in broad ligament and cause a broad ligament hematoma, which also needs surgery. Okay, कभी कभी this fetus, no, after getting uh, broken, it can go and attach to some of the peritoneal surface or some somewhere in the abdomen and get implanted and form a secondary abdominal pregnancy also. Okay, then sometimes this fetus it can go in some uh, get implanted in broad ligament and cause broad ligament pregnancy. Also. That's like a rare, rare outcome, but I have just written it to complete the slide. Now coming to clinical types of ectopic pregnancy, it can be acute, unruptured, and broad. I am going to mainly focus on acute because you know we are talking for emergency skills. <laughs> Again, then coming to acute, ruptured ectopic. See, this is like a triad of ectopic. Yes, these things are happening. It's going to be. You have to always suspect ectopic. The suspecting ectopic is always better than not suspecting it. Okay, there is preceded amenorrhea because pregnancy is happening. उसके बाद तब में they present with vaginal bleed after that. Okay, so people might tell amenorrhea कैसे है bleeding कैसे है. Amenorrhea period में आता है उसके बाद में bleeding हुआ रहता है. And abdominal pain. Most commonly they come with abdominal pain. Okay. Then, ah, now let's talk about when do they rupture? अभी देखो मैंने बोला था इस तरह से is short. So is the is the is the is the thin uh, no, sorry not thin it is uh, you know the lumen is narrower so it ruptures early at six to eight weeks ampulla is pretty thoda more dilated so eight to ten weeks whereas interstitial is having huge muscle pores so it ruptures very easily it ruptures at around eighteen to twenty weeks okay so rupture होने के बाद में मैंने देख बताया है hemoperitoneum कैसे होता है वो hemoperitoneum will go and irritate the peritoneum and it will cause vaso Motor disturbance, vomiting, and things. And also, hemoperitoneum is massive blood loss. Okay, so massive blood loss will cause shock. Shock के features में ये सारे hypotension, cold, clammy extremities वगैरह. Everything like shock. Okay. Now, pelvic exam. I have just put it in a slide. You see, while doing pelvic abdominal examination, abdominal will be tense and tender because it's like a, uh, you know, I have a uh, because it's like hemoperitoneum. Okay, so uterus will also be little more bulky because pregnancy established हुई है तो थोड़ा सा endometrial reaction रहता है. Okay, cervical motion tenderness may or may not be there. Spontaneous tenderness again may or may not be there. और shock के वजह से vaginal mucosa will appear very pale. Okay, and we have to be very uh, careful by examining doing a pelvic examination for PD for vaginal examination because you yourself can precipitate the hemorrhage. जैसे कि यहाँ पे clot बन के है क्या है? Okay. लेकिन हम पीली करेंगे वो क्लॉट डिस्लॉज होके बिकॉज मैसेज है सो यू टू बी वेरी केयरफुल फॉर पेल्विक एग्जामिनेशन इन केस ऑफ एक्यूट रप्चर डिस्लो कूल नाउ कम टू कमिंग टू अनरप्चर इट्स नॉट अ इमरजेंसी कंडीशन इट प्रेजेंट्स विद वेग एब्डोमिनल पेन मोस्टली वे प्रेजेंट विद सम मेंस्ट्रुअल डिस्टरबेंसेस ओके एंड एब्डोमिन एब्डोमिन पे भी टेंडरनेस रह भी सकता है नहीं भी रह सकता है फिर इन योर एग्जामिनेशन आल्सो यू मे फाइंड अ मास You may not find a mass. Unruptured tubal ectopic usually presents with uneasiness. You have no toxic features near it. Patient is not in shock or anything. Patient is just in a little discomfort. Coming to chronic or old ectopic, chronic ectopic here is also symptoms are similar to like uh, similar to unruptured ectopic only. Extra there can be bladder irritation, okay, or bowel irritation also because there are big hematocele which is a structure. Here. Okay, and the pulse persistently may be high. Pallor may be there if lot of blood loss has happened. Okay, it's a not so routinely encountered condition. Unruptured we do encounter, but chronic infection is not very common. Okay, so what do we see? Tenderness, uh, sorry, tenderness रह सकता है, नहीं भी रह सकता है. Uterus bulky हो जाता है. Cervical motion tenderness रह सकता है, नहीं रह सकता है. Potential tenderness may or may not be there. Or general mucosa may or may not be there. Same features है, but very mild and may or may not be there. Okay. Coming to how you diagnose it, there was a procedure, caldocentesis, where you know you used to go, put a needle in the posterior cortex, a unclotted blood is coming, so that is 
uh, that was pretty much confirmatory of entropic. But right now we have ultrasound, so nobody wants to do some invasive test. Uh, we have so good ultrasound machines, so why do something like that? So we have mainly two tests now. What we do for any case of ectopic come, these two tests we do. One is UPT, another is ultrasound. Okay, during pregnancy it is positive eye Uske baad then we do ultrasound. Ultrasound can be abdominal, and transvaginal. Okay, transvaginal is preferred because it can pick up even like it can pick up even earlier compared to abdominal. And you also you take help of Doppler. Doppler se kya karta chale? Okay, it mass hai, circular mass hai, pata chala ultrasound. Okay, so we use Doppler and see the vascularity of the mass there. That vascularity will aid us to tell that yeah, this is a group because it works. If it's an ectopic pregnancy, blood vessels around it are eroded, like I told, blood supply is around Ziyada Rayga. So, doctor will pick up that. But if it's just some kind of ovarian cyst or, uh, you know, pubo ovarian mass, you not have the fixed vascularity. Okay. Now, then there is also something called a surgical diagnosis, where we don't know why the why the patient has come with ectopic with uh, patient has come with ectopic abdomen and you know laparotomy. And then you find out, huh, we have a ectopic pregnancy. Yeah. Okay, that you can do laparoscopically also, laparotomically, uh, laparotomy also. And dilatation in curatage is mostly a B-level thing, how we use it for diagnosing uh, ectopic pregnancy. Uh, if we see, uh, like, like I'm not going to discuss that because it's not going to be much useful. But remember, if acute abdomen, that is surgical diagnosis is also a method. When the patient comes with acute abdomen and you open up the abdomen and then you see that, yeah, the pain is due to ectopic. Okay, now coming to management, okay, emergency skills comes in here. See, simultaneously you have to do resuscitation and surgery. It's not like the resuscitation and then you do surgery. No matter how much you resuscitate, the patient will not improve. And because surgery is the definitive management. So you have to keep doing both simultaneously. Ha, acute rupture is coming to the right side. You put two cannulas, you put two white bone cannulas, start fluids. Arrange blood because blood loss is right, and blood, the only fluids can only compensate a little bit blood loss. You need blood transfusion if it's massive. So arrange blood, two white bone cannulas, fluid rush no, and take immediately to OT. Okay. Only when you clamp, only when you clamp the tubes, only when you remove that ruptured part, that is when the patient will start improving. Patient is not going to so this thing, arrow mark, is just showing that resuscitation and surgery should go hand in hand. Okay. And the resuscitation measures should be, you know, on the way to the OT. Patient is going to the OT. We, we put, uh, in, in that time of one minute, you just do all the resuscitative measures and you open up the patient. Laparotomy. Acute ruptured ectopic laparotomy. No conservative approach. There is nothing, there is no role of conservative management at all. In acute ruptured ectopic, you have to open up the vision, you have to resuscitate the vision. Okay. Then coming to unruptured. Unruptured means there is role of you know conservative management. Okay, because this tube is still not ruptured, patient is pretty much uh, stable. If patient is unstable, so hemodynamically unstable patient, you don't wait for anything. You have to do surgical management only. You have to open up the abdomen remove the particular yeah, ectopic pregnancy or tie the tubes, then only the patient will improve. But if the tubes are not ruptured, you can go for something called as expected management and medical management, both. Now I want you guys to know the difference between expected management and medical management. See, expected management means you don't do anything. You just wait and observe the patient. That's expected management. Medical management is when you're giving some medicine, you're not doing surgical management. That's medical management. Okay. The expected management, when you are supposed to do, when you are doing serial beta HCG levels, every 48 hours you are repeating beta HCG levels and it's falling more than 20%. Okay. It's so we can tell that pregnancy abort more, I mean pregnancy resolved more and don't do anything. And it is done only in tubal pregnancy. Okay. And there is no evidence of intraperitoneal bleed or something because it is a rupture hai, so surgery ki karna hai. Diameter of ectopic less than 3.5. Some people say 2.5. And I think it's always better to go with 2.5 than 3.5. Okay. 
the then only you'll just sit and monitor serial beta and CG levels and you will put serial ultrasound. Wait for the uh, pregnancy to upon itself. That's expected. Which have hope that I expect that it be hard something like that. Then comes medical management. Where we give methotrexate. Methotrexate we usually give 50. Uh, you can tell okay 50 uh, 50 milligrams per square per meter square body surface area, or you can tell one gram per kg body weight. That's the dose of methotrexate we give. Single dose we have two regimens, but single dose regimen is good. Because by single dose regimen is preferred, because its compliance is good. One time injection is not needed. There are multiple doses that you can do also. Okay, but when more dynamically unstable patient is, if the patient is in shock, there is no role of medical management, only surgical management. If any intraperitoneal bleed or intraabdominal bleed is there, then also there is role of medical or surgical management, only surgical management. And a follow-up care should be there. Then only you do medical management. If you feel that the patient will never come back to you again, better do a surgery and send the patient. Okay, because medical management needs follow up. Even after giving the dose, you will have to follow up with beta hexagons. Whether it's rising, whether any remnant ectopic, any whether any persistent ectopic issue is left. Okay, that's right. Follow up. So absolute requirement for a medical management is no dynamically stable patient, no evidence of bleed, and follow up care is possible. All right. So, uh, what surgical? Uh, then comes surgical management. Surgical management here we can try conservative approach. You know, we can do a something more stormy. We can cut the, uh, we can make a small hole and we put the end. We can tie it off. Okay. Then we can do something more stormy, where we just make a hole and leave it like that only. We remove the end. We can just leave it like that. No need to suture the tube again. And there is a process. Uh, call, there is a method called as imperial expulsion. We just milk out the end. Okay, that's not followed anymore. Then there is radical exposure where they just remove the tubes, the classical thing what we used to do. Coming to now, I'm going to tell different types of pregnancies. I'm just going to tell what where implantation occurs and what is it. Uh, don't want to overload you guys. So if interstitial is when, जहाँ पे interstitial जहाँ पे tubes exactly जहाँ पे uterus को attach होता है वहाँ पे अगर implantation हो रहा है तो that's interstitial pregnancy. Okay, it has very high morbidity. Because uh, it will not get diagnosed for a long time. Interstitial pregnancy will looks like you know intra uh, intra uterine pregnancy only. It doesn't get diagnosed and it will rupture and will cause huge hemorrhage. Okay, because bada ho gaya. Then comes to coronal pregnancy. Coronal pregnancy uh, where in the pregnancy happens in the rudimentary form of the pyogenic. Okay, it's also a rare form of pregnancy. Usually, you know, her bicuspid uh, uh, uterus is associated with renal anomaly, so you just have to, you know, uh, also do a MRI and confirm that, or at least a USG is confirmed and rule out other urinary tract anomalies. Because if you're doing the surgery, it's better to do everything together. Then coming to ovarian pregnancy, there is a criteria, Spiegelberg's criteria, uh, you know, for that uh, criteria. The entire criteria is again a huge topic, but let's not. Just remember the name. Spiegelberg's criteria is for ovarian pregnancy, and for ovarian pregnancy, surgical management is preferred over the medical management. We don't remove the ovaries. Let me tell you, we just denuclear the ectopic part. Always try to save the ovary because you know usually ectopic pregnancies happen in young women. Okay, since uh, 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 you know removing ovaries is giving them a bad life. You know, ovaries are important for your bones, important for your skin. And everything. So removing the ovary in a young person is not such a good idea. So always try denuclearization or put as a vaginal solution. Coming to abdominal pregnancy, like I told, it can get uh, implanted anywhere in the abdomen, omentum, pelvic side walls, broad ligament, knee, bubble, diaphragm, etc. Just remember name again. It's pretty for criteria. Okay. It's primary or secondary. Primary means implantation direct abdomen will go there. Secondary method of implantation is occurring in the tubes and it's getting expelled, or from somewhere else it's getting expelled. Okay, then one point for me is remember is maternal mortality mortality is highest with abdominal pregnancy only because the placenta is implanted somewhere in the abdomen. If you cut the placenta by mistake or you remove pull the placenta, it's like uh, you have already sent the patient to you know. Great. It has high morbidity 
even if you don't do anything to plant them, wherever the placenta has been planted, if it is implanted on a major vessel, it's pretty much a uh, death sentence of the patient. Then the role of MRI. Here comes the role of MRI. Because see, I told you, placental implantation is very important in abdominal pregnancy. We have to identify where the placenta is. Because by chance, if we cut the placenta, it because uncontrolled hemorrhage. Okay, we don't know where the placenta is taking its blood from. Okay, if it's taking its uh, blood from some major vessel, it will cause uncontrolled, even a small leak will cause uncontrolled hemorrhage. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so hence always do a MRI. Plan your surgical approach such a way that you avoid placenta at any cost. Leave the placenta inside, it doesn't matter. It will save the life of the gender or mortality of the patient is low. But in case you try to remove the placenta, you cut it in the wrong place, that's it. It's, it's going to cause, it will cause massive, massive hemorrhage, uncontrollable hemorrhage. Okay, see. So if it's an early stage, you can do a laparoscopic removal. Provided the site of implantation does not have a vascularity, like I told you, if it's implanted on a vessel, it's already a very bad, uh, already a very bad thing to happen. Okay, if it's an advanced pregnancy, always do a laparotomy, and if placenta is attached to any major vessel or vital structure, leave it in situ. That has less morbidity compared to trying and removing it. Okay, then coming to cervical pregnancy, where the uh, implantation is inside the cervical canal. Okay. Uh, inside the cervical canal, internal loss is closed, external loss is thoda some open. So it ha you know it's like an hourglass appearance. Okay, so that's called an hourglass surface. Just remember that. It's, it has a Parkins criteria. Cause is very prior physical trauma, like if patients have undergone DNC before, they have a more risk of cervical pregnancy for some studies of trauma. Now, cervical pregnancies are also associated with high morbidity because cervical pregnancy can the bleeding control can be came of the people then. So what you do is to do DNC and then uh, you uh, have then you do some kind of hemostatic measure. Uh, hemostatic measure. Like you put a Foley stamp on art or you can do a uterine artery embolization. Okay. Then coming to a cesarean scar pregnancy wherein the implantation occurs in the myometrial defect. Okay, where there is a serious uterine decision where the implantation occurs. Okay, the problem with that is if whenever there is a scar, the placenta gets adhered very tightly. It may also cause heavy bleeding. Okay, it may rupture in the abdomen. Okay, here also you can try methotrexate, you can do suction evacuation along with hemostatic measures again, like uterine artery embolization. Or you can just remove the external scar. Then coming to heterotropic pregnancy, where if there is an intrauterine pregnancy along with the coexisting pregnancy, along with the coexisting ectopic. Here beta HCG is of little value because in the uterine pregnancy, when the beta HCG value does be normally right, it comes from the right. Okay. So here we have to take care of the intrauterine pregnancy. That is why you do not try medical money. So always surgical management in heterotropic pregnancy. Human identity is stable patient and locally ACL and hypersaline, uh, hyperosmolar glucose you can inject in the sac but this is not followed so much. Unstable patient is surgical. Chalo, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah so after, that was very interesting and very informative presentation. You've answered thank most you. of the questions beforehand uh, but still we have some, <laughs> some of the questions left. Uh, yeah, sure. I would ask, what is the relation between contraceptive devices and ectopregnancy? Uh -huh. Like I told, contraceptive devices, as such, as the absolute number, it increases the number of ectopic pregnancies. But again, see, what most of the contraceptive devices do is kind of an inflammatory state, which, you know, affects the motility of the sperm and the ovum. So it again, you know, affects the implantation. As such, as a coiving contraceptive device used by the the absolute number decreases. question we have how can infection be a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy yeah 
infection it does two things it will cause uh, inflammation and fibrosis so long term mein agar fibrosis hua hai to wahan se wo ye nahi jayega like hamara implantation ke jo patla is wo hum ek kaam ko if it fibro one thing yeah. and other thing is mucosal folds jo rehte hai fallopian tubes ke andar they all get precipitated as uh, it is supposed to be you know, like this as if see your energy but they you know they are completely as chipak jate hain chipak ja ke se collapse ho jate hain so there is you know that also effect so who cia ke movement ke wajah se jo ovum pass ho gaya hai that is not happening so again it is affecting the transport of the ovum and the ovum is stuck there and getting infected there so that is one relationship and inflammation is another relationship any tip basically it's a tubal pathology tubal pathology affects the transport of the ovum okay okay one last question we have that is uh, और Salting it to me is always easier. Okay, technically it doesn't require that much technical, uh, you know, uh, 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 the teaching is not needed. Uh, resident can easily do it. Okay, but salting for to me and all you need micro surgical instrument, sedative things. So much skill is needed for that. So if the patient is already having food leaving issues, if she is not desirous of a child, you can go for salting it to me. It can do. It's better for everyone. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it, uh, if you do, uh, if, uh, if she is nulli barren, she is not having any children. You want to preserve her fertility, then go for a salping. Good. See, when the uh, lady is not having any child, she is not having any leaving issues. You do every measure to preserve it. So that time you bring in the skill. If you don't have, <laughs> bring in someone who can do it. If you can, if it's possible, yeah. or else uh, you know you can maybe have other artificial intervention technologies for that. So that that's all for this session. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Sadhu, for that. Thank you.